Um, yeah, excited to uh, to host this fireside chat and uh, to kind of uh, learn a little bit from Kyle. Um, Kyle, uh, VP of Global Digital Marketing at Monster Energy. Um, I'm Mike, uh, VP of Marketplace at Iron Source. Um, 2021 is, is set to be a pretty interesting year for, for Iron Source and the entire mobile gaming industry. Um, so if you're not familiar with Iron Source, uh, we're one of the leaders in the in-app mobile gaming marketplace, uh, working with indie developers all the way to AAA studios like Activision, EA, and Zenga. Obviously, mobile video and mobile gaming is growing um, with everybody spending so much more time at home. Um, but today we're really looking forward to gaining a lot of insights from Kyle on the best ways that brands can kind of drive consumer engagement, gain attention, and really build new audiences. Um, so we will have 10 minutes at the end of this uh, for questions. So please uh, do, um, do drop any kind of questions into the chat and uh, we'll take those after. Um, but Kyle, I'd love to kind of start off uh, letting you kind of uh, have the floor and kind of talk a little bit about your background and your role. Uh, right on cue, there's my eight month old. Um, yeah, thanks for that, Mike. So yeah, I've been with Monster for over two years now, going on three years in October. Um, before that, I've worked at various digital agencies in the Los Angeles area. I had digital as a focus in my career going back to about 2007, 2008. So somewhat a digital native. Um, and what we're focused on at Monster now is really building out our digital infrastructure and sort of driving what the company was, was built upon, which is this sort of grassroots mentality and focusing that a little bit more on, you know, how do we amplify and scale that in a digital age? Monster came of age in 2002 through 2010, 11, before it was acquired by Coke. Um, and that was a different time period. And so now we're, we're assessing what we've done to get to where we are, which is, you know, one of the biggest beverage brands and, and one of the biggest energy drink companies in the world uh, and figuring out how we, we climb even higher. Yeah, I think that's super interesting, especially with, you know, the, the drink space being so incredibly crowded, the, the work that, um, that you guys have done to, to kind of grow that brand and to grow, grow that business is, is pretty important. Um, so I guess to kind of start, you know, how do you look at kind of consumer engagement and, and how do you understand the insights that are going to, going to lead you down different paths to, uh, to really making the decisions of, of, of how you invest digitally? So we focus on what I would call an attention based model. And that's all rooted in the philosophy that we're trying to instill in the digital marketing team, but also across the org that time is precious and therefore attention is priceless. And this is not something that we invented, but I think it's becoming more and more commonplace to focus on an attention based model. And, and the reason we do that is, you know, we really believe that if we're not earning people's attention in a way that is providing some sort of positive outcome for the end user, we're probably not going to get the actions we're looking for on the back end. So when we think about engagement, we're trying to move away from what many people would call those vanity metrics of what was our reach, how many impressions do we get, what was our, or our likes or our clicks. And we're really focused on looking at the entirety of somebody's journey to say, you know, how much time did they spend with us? And, you know, based on what we can learn from them in terms of actions or outcomes from that time spent, does it appear to be positive? Um, and if it's, it appears to be positive, does it appear to have been something that maybe influenced their decision making vis-a-vis -vis going to make a purchase? A lot of our business is still driven at the convenience retail level, um, which is people pulling one can out of the shelf, so to speak. So we're not DTC in the way a lot of companies are nowadays, where we can go straight to our e-commerce analytics and say, hey, how many how much traffic are we driving? And therefore, what conversion rate are we getting? And what's the, the lifetime value of these customers? We have to do a bit of Frankensteining to, to put it together, so to speak. But starting from that attention-based model helps us because if we can just address that we are, in fact, earning people's attention, that it is, in fact, generally a positive reception on their end, that's leading to some, what I would call action or, or intent-based outcomes, then we're doing our job, right? And then the question is, you know, how do you scale what works and how do you deprecate what doesn't? Yeah, and, and, I, and I'm, I'm assuming that, that there's many CPG brands out there that are, that are in that same boat where it's very difficult to quantify uh, investment, especially digitally when most of that, uh, those purchases are happening in store uh, on a one can basis. So, I mean, how do you get your, your your teams to all buy in to, uh, to the investment because it is so much harder to actually trend, uh, to, to uh, value and, and I guess uh, validate the fact that you, this investment will drive, will drive sales. How does that happen for you? That's a really good question. Um, we try to employ a couple key tactics. One is a red thread strategy 
And the other is using programmatic media um, in certain places where we know we can find our customers to show incremental lift or incremental intent, basically, and use those two things as a way to maximize the big bets the company's going to place, but then also at least indicate directionally or correlatively that, you know, hey, we're seeing some lift here. Maybe it's not, you know, um, increasing our, our revenue at the top line by a measurable amount. But what it is showing is it's showing that there's a, a consumer journey that's taking place, right? And that we're on the right track in terms of our priorities, how we're planning and executing those priorities. So the red thread strategy really is if the company's going to make a big bet, like the announcement we just made with partnering with Pulse Malone, for example, we're going to try to carry that all the way down to point of sale um, in the digital space as best we can. It doesn't mean that everything we do in that partnership is going to be about driving cans in hand. Part of it is the emotional equity and sort of the cultural equity that comes with partnering somebody like Post. Um, but we do try to think about, you know, if the brand team is running a promotion at point of sale geared around Post Malone and using his likeness and content we're creating with him, how do we use that in the digital space to help move people down the funnel, so to speak, um, versus saying, hey, let's create a separate promotional strategy or a separate promotional campaign apart from the lifestyle play we're making with Posts. And then that gets into at those point of sale or programmatic uh, levels, we try to look at using third party measurement that's aligned with our Salesforce, like Nielsen IRI. So, you know, if Salesforce is using Nielsen, and I'm, when I say Salesforce, I mean our Salesforce, not the company. When they're, if they're using Nielsen IRI to kind of look at how the business is moving, well, let's use that from a media standpoint. So we're at least using the same data sets or related data sets which makes having the conversations about what's working and what's not working and changes or, or optimizations we need to make a little bit easier than if you're using disparate data sets and a disparate approach to it. Yeah, and what you're doing with Post Malone and what you're doing in so many different categories or in so many different uh, areas is really being sticky, right? You're really focused on those passion points. And, and I think, you know, Monsters, you know, is one of the best, uh, best companies at understanding passion points and aligning with those passion points um, so can you share a little bit about some of the different passion points that you guys have, have kind of aligned with and, and kind of share a little bit about how you kind of engage, you know, different audiences, because I'm guessing the Post Malone audience is very different than some of the other audiences that you engage uh, that might be more, maybe it's uh, BMX bikes, right? Like it's probably a different audience and I'd love to learn about that. Yeah, so it's not as disparate as you think. Um, we've done a lot of research into this recently to show there's actually heavy overlap in a lot of our lifestyle pillars. So the big pillars are sports, music, and gaming. I think these are all obvious if, you, if you've seen Monster and you've seen what we're doing in just the social space, for example. You kind of know what we stand for and where, where we're sort of fostering growth and development in different communities. The brand's rooted in sport and action sport. That's, that's core to its DNA. Music and gaming have come along in the last decade as primary pillars that we're focused on. We've evolved those pillars over time from in music, for example, a, more of like a rock alternative punk ethos. Now trying to carry that through to the new areas where that same ethos is happening, which is hip hop and, and some of the, the more electronic and dance music uh, subgenres, if you will. And so what we try to do is just get back to what's our core DNA, which is Monster is that blue collar, irreverent, in your face to a certain extent brand um, that is apart from some of our competition in terms of how we present ourselves. And so we try to align ourselves in the communities like sports, music, and gaming with that ethos and with, with partners and people who represent that ethos or reflect that ethos back, right? So we're self-aware enough that we are never going to be um, Coca-Cola. Um, we're never going to be that brand that sort of appeals to almost everybody in some sort of respect or that has that level of brand awareness at that sort of high, high level. Um, we're a brand that is sort of carving our own space and we're very inclusive and want people to come along with that, but we also recognize that it's not for everybody. Um, and so we just try to double down on that and be self-aware at all times um, to make sure that we're not misrepresenting who we are or what we stand for to people um, in a way that could come across as inauthentic. And that's important because I think the, the core thing we're trying to do in these communities, Mike, is really be seen as endemic. We're not an endemic brand, right? Like gaming, for example, which I know crosses over into your area. Monster is not endemic per se, the way an Alienware or a Lenovo is. But we are seen by a lot of people in the gaming community as endemic because of the way we've approached the gaming community, which is to sort of support them at the grassroots level and celebrate their success as a community or as an esports org or particular individuals versus us trying to come in over the top with a corporate sponsorship right out of the gate. We've, we've worked our way up to that. We're now us being a partner in a big way with a dream hack 
or with teams like Team Liquid, it doesn't feel inauthentic because we've grown to that versus trying to come in at that as a starting point. Yeah, that's great. And, and, and I think, you know, sports, music, and gaming is, is so, so crucial. And, and, and I'm sure that there, so much has changed due to COVID. You know, obviously with sports and not having people in stadiums and, and at events, um, but would love to get your kind of thoughts on, on how those three, you know, categories have changed over the last, you know, year. And then what you see for that, you know, into the next year as, you know, people are vaccinated and people are coming back into stadiums, like how you see that changing kind of uh, uh, over the next few months. Yeah, it's interesting. I think there's going to be some things that stick from this COVID experience. Um, live streaming, for example, I think that as like a content medium or platform, if you will, for, for brands and for, for media and, and celebrities and influencers is going to stick because I think people see what the, how low a barrier there is to doing live streaming. It's like if you can create a setup in your house or wherever you are, you know, you can be online and, and creating content for people that they'll engage with. And the real time aspect of it, I think, is something people crave and are realizing is, is important to us, especially with everything now being kind of on demand. I can access it later. There is some specialness to something that's live and happening in real time. Um, I think what we're seeing is the need for, for us to continue to double down on this idea that we are different from, say, ESPN when it comes to sports and that we're not a news org. So what our differentiation is, is access to the ambassadors we work with. Um, and we tried to reflect that with a campaign we ran at the height of COVID in March, which was called Crush Quarantine. And the, the idea being, we're all going through this together. Um, and so let's leverage our ambassadors and influencers who are dealing with it just like our average fan is um, to have some fun and create some connections, some moments of levity. And again, going back to being self-aware, if Monster were to come out and do Kumbaya, I think a lot of people would call BS on us and say, that's really not what I think of you when I think of Monster Energy. What they do think of is having some fun no matter what and trying to figure out a way to, to sort of make that silver lining out of the darkest cloud. And so that's what we tried to do. I think that's going to persist even when, you know, events are fully back those live experiences are fully back. Um, because again, I think that's something that now people are exposed to more and more, sort of that intimate connection. And it's something we're all craving, whether it's family members, whether it's you know news and celebrity uh, people of influence that we follow or things happening in pop culture, we all crave sort of that, that more intimate connection that some of the um, COVID shifts in media have, have led us to sort of dabble in or, or to sort of outright um, adopt as part of our day-to-day, -day, you know, lives. Yeah, and I think so much is changing. And I think, you know, the the world, you know, hopefully and wants to come back and it'll be very interesting to see um, how everything does change. You know, I, I think one of the other big changes for, for this year in 21 will really be the deprecation of cookies and um, iOS 14 and, um, you know, as, as you lead the digital uh, marketing strategy for, for Monster, how does that kind of change your day to day and kind of just any idea about how that changes for the industry? It's a huge deal. Um, I, I think it, it gets covered a lot in the digital circles, certainly in, in the groups that we run in. Um, I don't know how much it gets covered in wider marketing. And so that's one thing we're really focused on is just making sure our marketing org and even our wider, just the company understands the implication of, of a cookie-less environment and what that means, which, you know, first and foremost is first party data is going to become the new gold standard, um, the new currency by which you can trade on in the media landscape. So we're focused on building our capabilities in that respect. We're focused on making sure that um, we have different scenarios planned out for what could happen when the cookies go away. I think that's one of the really interesting parts to this that's also a bit scary is I don't think any of us have a good handle because the industry writ large doesn't have a good handle on what's going to happen. So we're not necessarily putting all of our eggs in one basket. We're looking at different approaches. Um, certainly we want to acquire first party data from our most loyal consumers and fans and followers. That's, that's paramount. We do that on a regular basis and we're continuing to refine how we do that and how we use that data in sort of an honest and in integrity driven way to sort of better their experience. But then you have things like programmatic media where you're trying to reach new audiences and, and that'll become a little bit more complex and nuanced without cookies. And so we're looking at ways to leverage first party data in that regard um, with certain partners that again, we can trust, you know, have integrity as sort of one of their key principles and making sure that anything we're doing when it comes to consumer data is gonna be treated with the utmost care. 
um, and is going to be done in a way that provides value to them, which gets back to our attention based model, right? I'm trying to provide a value to you. I'm not trying to sort of like shove this down your throat. Um, and if you're not seeing the value, then there's a problem on my side, not on your side necessarily. And I was on mute. Uh, <laughs> um, I, I think that, you know, the, the, the programmatic landscape is, is going to be very interesting to see how, how, how everything moves forward. If data is less, uh, less available, does it move towards, you know, more contextual? And then it goes back to those three pillars that you mentioned with gaming and sports and music. And, and uh, I think it's going to be very interesting to see how those changes do happen over the next, uh, the next year or so. Um, and, and when you talk about attention, I, uh, I think about it just uh, from my day to day, you know, attention is, is so, so much harder to gain right now as a brand than it was probably five years ago and certainly more than it was 10 years ago. Um, do you see that same challenge or do you see kind of some of those opportunities, especially with the rise of programmatic, being able to, to, to play in all of those spaces uh, pretty, pretty seamlessly? Yeah, it's, it's really hard. I think what you're seeing is the, the internet is infinite, but people's attention spans aren't, and there's an inherent conflict there. Um, I, I think it's something we as, as digital marketers have to be very mindful of, which is just because something can stretch forever and ever, like the internet, or you can go into all these different places, or you can have a bottomless well of impressions, for example, um, it doesn't necessarily mean that that's valuable. And so that's where sort of the through play is one of our focuses at Monster, right? It's not about the number of views. It's about how long did people spend time with that content, right? Um, it's not about necessarily the amount of traffic. It's what did that traffic do? How many of those people took a journey that's valuable for them and for us um, that might lead to a conversion? So we're really sort of looking at those metrics as the ways of sort of figuring out how we earn more attention. Um, and again, it's being hyper-focused on where we think we have the best opportunity and not worrying about all the ancillary things, um, trying to be everything to everyone. It's about doubling down on what makes sense for us and what is core to us in terms of our brand DNA um, and where we wanna take the business. And that doesn't always line up neatly, um, but I think that's where we're trying to develop some agile processes and try to figure this out as we go. Um, we don't have a, a good handle on a five-year, 10-year roadmap. I think we're really just focused like a lot of people are, I think, especially because of COVID on the next 12 to 24 months, um, you know, and trying to come out of this fog and then realize like, hey, all right, now let's look at five years down the line and see where we are based on a lot of the trends that have accelerated during COVID even. Yeah, and, and I think that kind of goes back to how important, you know, insights and analytics are for, for how you're planning and, and uh, understanding what those consumption trends are going to be and, and what the attention is going to be in the next few months. It, it's much more uh, difficult, but it's probably more important than, it, than it's ever been. Um, you know, I, I'd love to kind of dive into that a little bit about, you know, understanding, you know, uh, the process around... Uh, insights and research and, 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 and how you view, you know, the, the consumer behavior changing um, and, and how much has that changed with COVID? Because obviously you mentioned there was a lot of change, but, you know, what is, what are the big changes you, you have seen? Yeah, I mean, the, the three big ones I've seen are, are streaming consumption, gaming consumption, and DTC consumption, let's call it. So um, to start with streaming, I do think you're going to see that, oh, hold on one sec. You, you are going to see that um, come back to the mean a little bit. I think as people go back out into the world, I don't think we're all going to be sitting in front of our, our YouTube TV as much um, as we were during COVID. On the flip side, I, I think the, the gaming element of this is going to become much more um, ingrained in everyday life to some degree, because I think things like mobile gaming are things people can continue to kind of adopt as they go back out into the real world and kind of be on the go with it. And that's where we've seen a lot of a, a growth on our site in gaming is in the mobile space. Um, it's not the hardcore gamers who are spending more time doing what they already spend a lot of time doing. It's people who picked it up during COVID and said, hey, this is kind of fun. I might stick with some of this stuff. The one that's really sticking and it's really affecting our business is the DTC e-commerce shift. I think if, if we were on a five-year timeline for a certain trajectory, it's now half that. 
Um, and I think a lot of businesses are realizing that now, right? Everybody's sitting at home and not wanting to go out and realizing you can order your groceries online, realizing that um, it's really, really easy to kind of curate your refrigerator without ever having to leave your house um, and cost efficient, frankly. And if you think about time as a cost, I don't think that's going anywhere. If anything, I think it's just going to continue to accelerate. So that's one I, I would peg as the one we're really, really focused on is the the e-commerce and DTC component and trying to make sure that our business stays ahead of the curve on that one. Yeah, and, and ultimately that probably provides you with uh, a lot more data that can inform your marketing strategy and, and kind of what you're seeing on, on your side. So um, DTC, it, it just opens up so many different opportunities, uh, not only for the business, but also for from a digital marketing perspective. Um, so, um, you know, I, I'd love to kind of talk a little bit more about some of the, you mentioned Post Malone, but I'd love to talk a little bit more about some of the, uh, the different partnerships that you've seen that, that have really kind of worked well and, and how have those kind of come together with, is it more influencer marketing or is it more um, within commercials? How have you seen kind of those uh, celebrities um, and those endorsements kind of help your, you know, your messaging? Sorry, my, my eight month old is commanding my attention right now. So I'm trying to like get her situated. You good? You okay? Um, yeah, I think this is where I would say we're in a good position at Monster because of how we've operated from the get-go, which is we're focused on making sure that we're being grassroots oriented in our approach to this versus um, trying to come in over the top with what you would consider a more traditional partnership opportunity that involves, say, a Super Bowl TV ad. Like, that's just not something we're ever going to do. So our work with someone like Pulse Malone or in the gaming space with different partnerships we've done like Halo last year is always going to be sort of focused on being digital first and grassroots oriented. That's just how the company operates. Um, I think that's where you're going to see more value going forward because I think, um, I don't know if we're in an influencer bubble, but I think we are certainly reaching the upper bounds of the sort of corporatizing of, of influencer marketing. And the way back is going to be focusing on your grassroots communities and trying to identify the next group of, of micro or nano influencers, the people who are just passionate about your products and your brand and helping them get an elevated platform versus going and find somebody who may already be elevated. Yeah. And, and, and you kind of mentioned it when, when we first talked about how, you know, the, there's constantly new audiences that are kind of coming of age as a, as a target and as a target demo for, for Monster. And um, I'm, sure, I'm, I'm sure that's not the easiest to constantly be iterating yourself to be able to, uh, to attack those users and attack those demographics that are kind of coming into your wheelhouse. Um, but would love to know a little bit more, and I know you have your hands full, so um, would love to know a little bit more um, about how you look at that and the changing uh, of those audiences as they kind of come into your target. Yeah, that, that's one that I think is really interesting for us because um, we have such a wide array of, and a, a sort of a deep well of products, which I don't think a lot of people realize about Monster. Um, you know, one of our key points of differentiation from competition is the depth and breadth of our portfolio. I mean, we, we make coffee-based products, we make enhanced water beverages, um, we make zero sugar products, um, juice, tea, um, and I think a lot of people don't realize that, and, and that's great. And that's sort of driven a lot of our growth, that innovation, which is core to, to who we are as a company. The challenge is marketing all that. Um, the challenge is putting priorities on all that when each of them have their own growth trajectories, each of them have their own roles to play within the overall portfolio. And to your point, some of them can have some very disparate audiences. When I think of a product like our Dragon Tea, um, that is a different type of consumer when you think about somebody who goes into the tea door on a regular basis at a convenience store versus somebody who may shop traditional energy drinks um, or shop somebody who's shopping for something that's maybe a little bit better for them in the enhanced water space. And so we wrestle with this a lot and it's one of our key focuses, like how do you tell that brand story in these different extensions in a consistent way? Um, and, and it's something that I think we're spending a lot more time looking at category management insights to kind of focus on and help us learn how can we tie this all together um, so people understand this differentiation that we have because it's the one common thing if you go into a grocery store or a convenience store and you show somebody all the different products on the shelf that are monster, the general reaction is usually oh, I had no idea um, and I might actually like that one. 
right? But, but there's sort of a brand ethos that we're trying to keep and yet also evolve so that we can extend the brand in these different ways in a much more meaningful fashion. Yeah, and, and that's gotta be so hard to do to, to manage you know, such a, a powerful brand um, that has that ethos um, and, and try to extend that into, into other areas. Um, you know, I, I know we have a few more minutes before we take any questions and, and please do, uh, if, you're, if you're listening, please do uh, post a few questions. We'd love to take some of those. Um, but, you know, I'd, I'd love to get, you know, your sense in terms of, of, of looking at, you know, the, the CTV space, for example, and, and seeing that kind of that big shift when COVID hit. And you mentioned you still think that's going to happen, but not nearly at, at the same, you know, increases, um, you know, month over month or year over year. But would love to kind of know, you know, how do you kind of look at a space that's, that's so wide as the CTV space? Do you still kind of try to align within the passion points of gaming and sports and music within that category? Are you looking more at like demographics and audience-based information? How does that kind of translate to, to your world? It's a combination of factors. I mean, certainly we want to stay core to who we are. So those pillars play a huge role. Um, for example, you're not going to see us doing anything that sort of ties us into or is adjacent to news content because it's just not core to our brand. I don't think it's something think people think of when they say, I want to stay on top of what's happening in the world. Let me go check out Monster. Um, so the pillars play a role. Um, audience information plays a role as well, the contextual element. It's less demographics and more psychographics. So, you know, sort of extrapolating from the pillars, from our brand ethos and the people who shot Monster today, what are those reasons why they shot Monster? What are the reasons why somebody who doesn't might want to pick up a, one of the different products that we make? Um, demographics, I would say, are probably the tertiary thing. Obviously, there's a bit of an age ceiling on energy drinks. You don't see too many 50 and 60 year olds drinking them. But I think for us, um, that can be limiting when you put that at the front of the line in terms of filters for your targeting and your media strategy. If you're just going after 18 to 24 year olds, you're missing a huge opportunity potentially with people who have the same mindset who might just be three, four, five years older. Um, and so that's kind of the rank order is we try to look at like, where do we need to be that maps to our pillars and maps to our brand? What sort of message do we need to bring or how do we want to interact ideally with those people in places like Roku, for example, where you can be a little bit more um, interactive than running a straight 30 or 15. Mm -hmm. And then the last piece would be, okay, now let's look at, you know, where do, where are the places, the channels, if you will, that the audience from a demographic standpoint, if we get down to that bullseye, where do they spend most of their time? And let's go find ways to be in front of them there. That's awesome. Yeah, no, it makes a ton of sense. Uh, psychographic is, is, is so important, especially for a brand like Monster. Um, great. So, I mean, um, I'm going to have one more question for you. Uh, it's kind of a fun question and, and uh, something that I thought was, uh, was really interesting. And uh, so um, we'll talk a little bit about the Super Bowl. Um, and I don't know, Kyle, did you, did you watch the Super Bowl? I did, but with an eight month old and a three year old, it's a bit of like, I'm trying to catch plays in between bedtimes and bath times. And then you get to a point where you've seen the score and you, you realize it's probably not worth me going back to the DVR. I kind of know what happens already, but um, I caught a, I caught a bit of it. Okay, perfect, perfect. Yeah, I, uh, I, I have a three year old as well. So uh, middle of bedtime, we, we paused it for a little while. So we didn't actually finish the Super Bowl until about after an hour after the, uh, the, the game ended. Um, but, but so my three-year-old actually stopped playing with what she was doing and immediately was glued to the TV when the Huggies commercial came on and, uh, would love to get your thoughts on what you thought was kind of one of the, the best, uh, CPG commercials that resonated with you. Um, and that left a kind of a lasting in, in impression. So I'd love to get your thoughts on, on which ones kind of stood out. Uh, let me see here. I'm trying to remember the commercials I saw in the like aggregate 20 minutes of time I watched. Um, the Jeep one resonated with me, I will say, um, but not in a positive way. It was one of those where you kind of went like, did they forget what was happening right now with putting this message out? Um, and I, I mean that in like the most general sense. It's like between COVID and what's going on with politics. That, that one struck me as a little bit sort of like in any other year, that would be a great message probably for them. Um, and it probably is on brand for them, but, but just given the context and kind of to the last question you were asking about, you know, contextual targeting and relevance, that one felt a little bit kind of like, huh, okay, that's, that's one way to do it, I guess. 
and 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 to wit now we're kind of seeing some fallout from that so i think that was one that kind of stuck with me i think you're on mute mike <laughs> thank you for calling that out again uh <laughs> uh life of covid um so we did have a question from uh from the audience uh so um Megan asked, how are you repurposing the in-person experience budgets uh, during COVID? Yeah, we, we're really not. Um, we're, we're bringing that back to the bottom line. I mean, a lot of what we do is with longstanding partners. We're not into one-offs. So a lot of this is working with those partners to say, hey, things aren't happening. Um, we obviously don't want to pay for those things. Um, you guys want to sustain your business. We want to be a partner in the long run. So how do we do that, right? How do we work together? It's different in some spaces like gaming where um, the live physical event may not be happening, but they're moving everything to the streams and putting more focus there. So in those cases, we're, we're honoring those contracts and trying to figure out with those partners like, hey, how do we get more value out of the, the digital experience right now? So it's sort of a case by case basis. But I think what we're really trying to do is sort of bank the equity with the partners um, versus just saying, OK, well, let's take that money and put it elsewhere immediately. Our, our business is doing well, and so we don't see an immediate need to sort of double down or up the ante, if you will, in certain areas. Um, instead, it's more about kind of curating ourselves through this with our partners so that when we all come out on the other side, we have those relationships intact. We've learned along the way, and perhaps we can just evolve them um, over the next couple of years as we continue to work with those folks. Yeah, and, and as the digital lead, I'm sure that you love anything going digital, probably gives you a little bit more data and a little bit more insights and a little bit more information to do. It's, your it's good. And then it's also, you know, when everything else shut off, and I'm sure there's folks who are listening who are, are in the digital space, it's like everything else quit, right? And so everybody just turned their heads immediately to digital. And it's like, what are you guys going to do? And it's like, I, okay, we'll get on it, you know, sort of a thing. It's like, I'm not a cure all. We'll figure this out as we go too, just like you guys are. No um, and I, I think we did a great job and part of that was because we had other teams like our brand management, our sports, our music, our gaming teams who were like, hey, let's do some stuff. Let's figure this out together. So that was great. Um, but it was definitely a challenge. Uh, it was definitely and we're still dealing with that, right? It's like we're, we're slowly coming back with things like Supercross or professional bull riding and some things in the southern states in particular, but it's not where it used to be. Um, music is still non-existent in that capacity. And so we're, we're kind of trying to learn what we did a year ago, which is crazy to say, and reapply it right now until we get back to some state of normalcy. Awesome. Uh, well, Kyle, Brand Innovators, thank you all for, uh, for this time. Uh, it was very insightful. Uh, it was a lot of fun. Uh, and, I, and I hope uh, you get some time with Hannah. Um, I remember those months with- uh, It's, with it's lunchtime right after this, yeah. <laughs> And it's eight month old is demanding. So uh, thank you. That's, for that that's probably why she's pulling on the chair right now. It's like, dude, <laughs> food. Exactly. Thank you both so much. I did not know that there was a coffee based monster product. So consider me converted as I go buy some this afternoon. Awesome. That's great. <laughs> um, thank you both so much for closing out this summit and obviously taking us uh, behind the curtain. We all learned so much. Um, I really think there was something for everyone here today. And personally, being at Group Nine, that the insights into the brand social strategy, programmatic approach, partnerships, audience engagement, audience engagement, excuse me, all the things was hugely beneficial. So thank you again. And we also hope you all join us Tuesday at noon Eastern Standard, Standard Time um, for our summit on the future of travel. We will be joined by marketing leaders, um, Expedia, Visa, Marriott International, and more. So thank you everyone for joining. <laughs>